Sunday morning, countryside. Why don't you stand with us? Let's bless the Lord. Whether we're going through some difficult times or good times, we can always bless the Lord. Let's sing together. Blessed be the of the Lord. Ha! Let's do the chorus. Here we go. Blessed be your name. Amen. You may have a seat. Well, good morning and welcome to Countryside. If we haven't met before, my name is Dan, and it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, we're so glad that you're here. Um, we would love to help you just take a next step in belonging here at Countryside. And to do that, we'd love for you to fill out the Connect card on a chair near you. Um, you can fill it out. There's also a place for prayer requests on that card. You can turn that in at the end of the service. We'd love to follow up with you that way. Uh, this past Easter, uh, Pastor Peter mentioned in the sermon that a really good next step for you, if you are wanting to know more about Jesus, is to sign up for the Intro to Jesus class. Um, this class is a one-off video class uh, led by the historian John Dixon, uh, anchored in the uh, historical evidence for Jesus. 
Um, this course is happening this Saturday night, the 20th, from 7 to 9 p.m. It's actually at Pastor Peter and Claire's house. Uh, there's food and drinks involved as well, so if you are wanting to come, we'd invite you to sign up and RSVP online, uh, or you can shoot Peter an email as well and let him know you want to come. So it sounds like an awesome opportunity. Uh, we've been mentioning the dates for our youth summer trips for some time now, but today we just want to know or note for you that the registrations are now live for those trips. So we are headed back to Sun River with the high schoolers June 27th through the 30th, renting a bunch of homes there in Sun River. Uh, and then we're heading back to Rockaway Beach with our middle school group, renting Twin Rocks Camp, and that's from July 25th through the 27th. Um, and so the registrations are now live. If you're currently in middle school or currently in high school, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, these are some of my favorite times to just be more present with each other and more present with what God is wanting to do in us. So we'd love for you to join us for those. Uh, lastly, just by way of update, uh, this past season, we as a church have been invited to come alongside the Sherwood track team uh, and support them and their athletes. And one of the ways we were asked to do that uh, was to donate and supply snacks for when the team goes on away meets. And so many of you went to the store, bought, and donated, dropped off here snacks for the track team. Uh, now for a couple weeks, we have had a team from Countryside head over to the high school when the teams are loading up on the buses, personally giving snacks and water bottles, learning names, and just being that encouraging personal presence for the students at the high school. I got to go last week, and it was a blast. Um, that is only possible because of many of you buying and donating the snacks. So we just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you for being willing to demonstrate God's love in practical ways like that. Um, that's all I got. With that, why don't you stand up for a moment and greet someone around you. And if you're joining us from online, we are so glad you're here. Um, as always, we'd love for you to fill out that Connect card online if you haven't yet. Um, and as always, we'd love, if you haven't yet, to join us for a service here at Countryside, either at 915 or 11, so we'd love to have you join us. Stay tuned and we'll be back in one moment.
worship a holy God, don't we? Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else would whisper and darkness tremble? Only a holy God. What of the beauty demands such praises? What of the splendor outshines the sun? What of the majesty rules with justice? Only a
Jesus is your glory. We lift him up today. He is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. Worthy. Worthy, 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 Lord. Another glimpse of glory. Sing once more. Worthy, worthy. may be seated as you join me in prayer. Yeah, Lord, like we were just singing and praying, we just wanna behold you this morning. We wanna behold your glory. Would you take our eyes off of distractions this morning and fix them on you? And let us behold you and see your holiness, your beauty, your compassion, your justice, your love for us. And God, as we look to you as holy, we are reminded that we are not. We have all fallen short. We've gone our own way in our sin. And so we pray, forgive us. And that is our prayer today, Lord, though, that you would make us holy, that you would make us like Jesus. Like Colossians says, Lord, lead us to take off things like sexual immorality, impurity, evil desires, greed, anger, rage, filthy language. And in place of all those kinds of things, God, let us put on Christ daily and be clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. Would these be the kinds of things that mark us as a church, as a whole? Uh, This past week, Lord, we we thank you for the chance to celebrate um, baptisms together. We lift up all those who made that public declaration. We just ask that you would grow them in confidence in the truth and who they are in you. We also just thank you for that time to be together for pancakes last week. We thank you for the ways you're just continuing to grow us closer together. And so would you help each of us take a responsibility to reach out and to invite people in? Uh, Lord, we pray for college students in our community that have finals coming up soon. Would you give them peace as they trust in you and give them clarity to study well, test well, and to write well? And we ask for provision for anything they need um, as they head into the summer season. And Lord, finally this morning, um, my heart is just grieved by the violence and threats of even larger war in the Middle East. Um, We cry out to you and know that this is not what you uh, designed us for. And so God, we cry out to you just to end this violence and to bring your peace in that region. And God, in, in all things, we, we come back to you. Uh, we trust you and we trust in your word to lead us to uh, put our hope in Jesus. So we ask that you would just open our hearts to hear from your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm gonna invite you one more time to please stand for the scripture reading this morning. We're gonna read from 1 Peter as we open our new series in the book of 1 Peter, we're gonna read 1 Peter verses one through two. Uh, It's just two verses and half of it is some fun sounding city names, so I decided to take one for the team today and and read this myself. (laughs) It says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Well, good morning. 
Man, I'm so thankful for Dan. It just, our church is so blessed uh, with who he is. And uh, yeah. The blessing of God pours out to our church through Dan. And I'm so thankful for Pastor Peter and the team leading us in worship this morning. What a gift it is to be together, gathered in the name of Jesus to exalt the Son and worship him. Well, we are beginning a new series today on 1 Peter. You got that in the first two verses. Um, We'll see if I can make it in time when I only have two verses. (laughs) It'll be close. Um, If we haven't met, my name is John. I'm one of the four pastors here co-pastoring the church, and it really is a blessing to be here with you, and I'm so thankful that you're here this morning. One of my favorite movies all time is the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I mean, come on, right? (laughs) Yeah, when, you know, the movies, I saw them all in the theater, then they got released on DVD way back in the day when we had DVDs. But we waited until the extended version of the DVDs were released. The extended version made an already long movie very much longer. The total running time for the three films was 11.5 hours. Glorious hours in total. A great way to spend a day when you're sick. (laughs) But then on the DVDs, you also have the bonus content that showed you how the films were made. And I know I'm a big nerd, but I loved watching hours of bonus content to see how Peter Jackson had this vision for a film so big, and I mean, computer graphics was only in its infancy, so what he accomplished was truly amazing. Watching through all the bonus content, it's like you open up the curtains and get to see a behind the scenes of how this movie came to be. That's kind of what it feels like with the book of First Peter. You have this amazing book, but then you have like all this bonus content because of the author, Peter, the apostle. Um, I don't know if there's another author, especially in the New Testament, that we have so much source material on his life. The beginning of his discipleship, when he first starts out and Jesus calls him, the middle of his discipleship through the book of Acts, and then we get to the end of his discipleship when he is a mature disciple in Christ now, very close to the end of his life, writing from the, the position of maturity in Christ. The series that we're stepping into with First Peter, uh, I've titled the series, The Making of a Mature Disciple. That's what we get to see in Peter's life, the making of his life as a mature disciple, but also we get to see what it looks like in maturity as Peter writes from this place. It's messy, it's painful, and yet it's beautifully inspiring. So as was read, the book starts in verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect exiles scattered among the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So number one, we get to understand about the author and his readers. Peter is the author. If you have your outline, which I hope you do because there's a lot of bonus content on your outline today that you're going to want to take home. So if you didn't get one, make sure you get one. Um, But we know that this book is written by Peter because verse 1 tells us that. And it is also placed, as I mentioned, very close to the end of his life, perhaps a year, maybe a little bit more before his death. Church tradition has him dying, crucified, but not wanting to be crucified in the same way of, as the, his Lord, so he was crucified upside down according to church tradition. Peter gives his purpose in writing at the, towards the end of the book in chapter 5, verse 12, where he says, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God, stand fast in it. 
So he's written both to encourage, bring encouragement, but also to give testimony. Peter has experienced and he's lived out the true grace of God. He's a walking testimony of God's grace. And he wants to be able to share that with the church. Peter is a witness to God's grace. Now, as I've been reading through the book in preparation for today, I came to the conclusion that if Peter were to read this book early on when he first started following Jesus, he probably would not have liked it very much. Some of the things that were said would have been really hard for him to grapple with. At worst, maybe he would have even rejected because he was so stubborn, rejected the things that he wrote later in life. Well, why do I say this? I say this because as I read through 1 Peter, images of Peter's discipleship flashed through my mind. So this is what I did. I threw this together for you on the back of your outline. If you have an outline, turn it to the back. Uh, This is not an exhaustive list, nor is it scholarly. This is just Pastor John reading and making connections in his own mind, uh, and hopefully it's helpful to you as well. Things in which we see Peter's life in the gospel that he encountered, how he dealt with it, and then how that relates in his own disciple-making process uh, to what he writes in 1 Peter. First of all, Peter was chosen. Remember, Jesus in Matthew 4 comes up and he says, follow me and I will make you a fisher of people, fishers of men, right? And then 1 Peter 2, you see him speaking because being chosen mattered so much to Peter. He's speaking now to the church, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Peter also got a new identity, In Matthew 16, Jesus told them that uh, he is now Peter. He was born Simon, but Jesus calls him Peter, and he says, on this rock I will build my church, a new identity. Well, in 1 Peter 2, he speaks to the people a new identity. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be holy, priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Another theme, connecting point we see is Peter's perspective on suffering. In Matthew 16, where Jesus began to teach that uh, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem and die and and suffer things, Peter stood up and he's like, uh, Peter said, no, Lord, you won't suffer. May it never be, right? And then Jesus rebuked Peter uh, and, you know, actually pretty harshly. (laughs) And then the, his, Peter's perspective on suffering shifted to words in 1 Peter 4 where he, he says like, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. We see growth in Peter's humility and servanthood. In John 13, when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, Peter's like, no, you will never wash my feet. Because Peter didn't understand. And then here in the letter of Peter, he says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. We see Peter's perspective on submission. In John 18, when they were in the garden uh, and Jesus was about to be taken away, Simon pulled out a sword and cut off the ear of a servant. There was no submission to authority. There was fighting with the sword. And then Peter, uh, 1 Peter 2 says, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperors or to the supreme authority. Then you have Peter's failure with the enemy. Remember, Peter denied Christ. You see this in Luke 23, uh, 22 when Peter was being crucified. Peter, or When Jesus was being crucified, Peter's like, I don't even know who he is. The enemy sifted Peter. But then you see in 1 Peter 5, Peter's like, be alert and of sober mind because the enemy 
uh, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Peter knew what it was to be devoured by the enemy. So he offers warning against it. And then we see Peter's commission uh, at the end of John 21 where after the resurrection, they're on the beach and Jesus comes up and says, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I love you. Happens three times. Then Jesus says, well, feed my sheep. These words must have stuck with Peter throughout his whole life because in 1 Peter 5, as he's nearing the end of the chapter, he says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Watch over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. So I love reading 1 Peter, the, the perspective of a mature disciple, but realizing he was not always like that. He was rough. He struggled. He made mistakes. But our lives are not measured by our mistakes or our worst moments. Our lives, if we are in Christ, are measured by the power of the Holy Spirit transforming our lives over the decades, over a lifetime. Jesus sees you, his disciple, with a perspective that's a, that's a lifetime of transformation, not just a moment of brokenness, not just a moment of pain or of sorrow. I don't know, I, I, I've always been achievement-oriented, so I've always wanted to rush my discipleship. <laughs> I've always wanted to be more mature than I am. I probably still do, though I'm relaxing some, uh, giving way to the Spirit in my life. I've had my own brokenness and my own failings, and yet by God's grace, I can stand with Peter giving testimony to the grace of God that it's true. And it's not about this moment in my life with you. It's what God is doing over the course of my life, slowly, faithfully making me a mature disciple in Christ. I'm not there, but I am going there. And by God's grace, I will be there. So that's Peter. He's our author. But we also have the readers. Who are these readers? Well, they're Christians, so he's writing to Christians in the provinces of Asia Minor. So all these provinces that are listed here out in verse 1 are in the region of northern Turkey in our current modern-day map. It was largely Gentile. However, there were Jews uh, in the mix as well. What's most interesting about the timing of the letter is that it was written sometime around 64, maybe 65 AD, right around the first major persecution of Christians, the first major time where the church was persecuted. So Nero was late in his reign, and there was the great fire of Rome in 64 AD. So Peter's writing right somewhere in this time of the great fire in Rome. And what happened was Nero decided to blame the Christians for the fire. And with that as his platform, he began to do horrible things, uh, torture of Christians over the next few years. Uh, some accounts say throwing Christians to the beast or crucifying them or burning them alive. So Peter is writing just right before uh, or perhaps in the very early stages of this persecution, not too long before he himself was crucified um, as a result likely of this persecution. So this book would have been like a lifeline for Christians who are under this persecution. At least 15 times he mentions suffering throughout, throughout the book. And he uses eight different Greek words to do so. So the suffering that the church in this region experienced was deep and it was intense. And this book became a lifeline. And there's something for us here as well. What astounds me about what he writes about suffering and, and what it sounds like is he never takes up a spirit of victimhood. Seems like 
in a lot of circles that I run in when Christians here in America suffer some for, form of oppression, probably not being thrown to the beast or crucified or burned on fire, <laughs> but some form that feels like it comes with a tone of victimhood. And yet, this is not how Peter writes. Peter's words on suffering is experiencing it with joy for the gospel, not just suffering in general. We're not talking about just hardship in general, but if you suffer for your faith because you belong to Jesus, that there's this deep joy because you get to participate in the sufferings of Christ. And the suffering uh, is, is what we see as Christ is brought into the resurrection and glorified. We get to, when we endure suffering, we get to see the glorified Christ. We get to participate in his glory as we participate in the suffering. So the Holy Spirit is preparing through Peter, the church of Asia Minor, um, for what is about to come. And then we move into our next verse, verse 2. Who have been chosen, speaking of the Christians in this region, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace to you. Our, grace and peace be yours in abundance. What I love about this verse is we get to see the power and the grace of the Trinity at work. One of the core doctrines uh, that is distinct to Christianity and uh, really links Christianity together is the doctrine of the Trinity. There is one God. There is one creator of the heavens and earth. And yet this God has is three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, make up the Godhead, sharing the same essence. And so we see this, the work of the Father, the work of the Spirit, and the work of the Son in this passage. The first thing is chosen by the Father. Chosen by the Father is profound language. As the Gentiles once believed that they were outside of the mercy of God. That was what was thought of at the day, that the Gentiles were once believed to be outside of the mercy of God. And now he is taking the language that in the past was reserved for Israel, and he's applying it to all who are in Christ. Let me give you a verse that uh, shows how God talked about Israel. Deuteronomy 7, 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Your Lord, the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. And that was what brought fear to the other nations, that Israel They weren't just a nation. They were a nation chosen by God, his people, his treasured possession. And now Peter is taking this language that was reserved for Israel and applying it to all of the Christians in this region. region. Words that would give hope to a suffering church, that you are chosen by God. You are his treasured special possession. Being chosen for a great purpose will be of great comfort to a church who is about to endure persecution. The other thing we see, uh, and I'll pull this from the first verse, but is also the word exiled. The people here are chosen and exiled. A reminder that this world is not our home. Yes, we live here, but ultimately we don't belong here. Our true home is, is in the presence of the Trinity in heaven forever. So why does this matter? I mean, all these people that, people that Peter's writing to are dead, right? Like, it was a couple thousand years ago that this was, write, that this was written. The first century Christians uh, suffered tremendous per- persecution, yet they faithfully passed on the torch of the gospel to the next generation. 
They were faithful with the gospel and it spread and they handed it to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And through the power of the Spirit, the words of the church to the first century in Asia Minor are now relevant to encourage us who are also chosen to bear the torch of the gospel and also exiled in that heaven is our true home. We are chosen by the Father. That should, that should do something inside of you, that you are chosen by the Father. Pastor Mike last week uh, talked about how in our, in our Western mindset, it's so easy to think individualistic. Right? It's so easy just to personalize your salvation and everything. But what we see here is that Peter is talking to Christians in a region. The, the Christian church is chosen. So we don't want to read this just individually. In fact, I don't even want to read it just as countryside. Because that even feels a little bit too self-focused for me. Not just reading it as our organization, but reading it as, think about the church in Sherwood, maybe the church in our region, the Portland metropolitan area, whatever it is, that we collectively are chosen by God for such a time as this. It is not an accident that you have been born in this time, in this day, in this region. We are here, we collectively, the church one church, one family, one body, we are here for such a time as this. We've been chosen by God for this day by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that should matter to us. That should give us courage, and that should give us hope, just like it did the first century church. And then the next phrase we see in chapter 1, verse 2, is through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. We are sanctified through the Spirit. One of my favorite verses on sanctification, I, I was reading this phrase, sanctified through the Spirit, and I knew exactly which verse I wanted to go to. Memorized it a long time ago. It's 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 and 24. It says, may God himself, right, the emphasis there, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Man, isn't that a great verse? Sanctification is the word, which just means it's, it's the process of becoming more like Jesus, just like you saw in Peter's life over a lifetime. That process is done by God. You can't sanctify yourself. It is the work of the Spirit in your life that brings sanctification. Why? Because he is faithful and he will do it. So it's interesting. I, re I remember that verse. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to use that verse. But then I always like to read it in context. So I pulled it up. And I had another verse right before it that I've memorized. But crazy me. I don't think I've ever taught these two verses together before, even though they're right next to each other in the passage. So let's just go up to verse 19, where it says, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all, holding on to what is good, rejecting every kind of evil. And then it says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Do not quench the spirit. That word quench is a word that carries the meaning of throwing water on a fire. You quench a fire by throwing water on it. You know what's amazing to me about this command? Is that God allows himself to be quenched. The Spirit of God allows himself to be quenched in your life. Sometimes we might quench the spirit in our own life. Man, I've been there. I've thrown water on the fire of the spirit on my life. I know what it is like to have the spirit of God burn inside of me, to cleanse me of sin, to want to weed out all this stuff, to give me faith and to give me hope, to experience that in my life. And I also know what it is like 
for me to quench, to throw water on that in my own life because I want to do my own thing. I also know what it is like to have somebody outside of me throw water on the Spirit's fire in my life. We can quench the Spirit in each other's lives. It says, don't do that. The Spirit is trying to bring sanctification into your life. Don't quench the Spirit. Then he says, don't treat prophecies with contempt. You know that word for prophecies there, it's the same word that is offered in other passages that talk about the gift that God gives to the body. Why? For the building up of the body and for the encouragement of the body. So God gives his heart to people so that people can speak his heart over other people. And so what do you do? Well, you test everything against the word of God. How do you know uh, whether something comes from God or not? We have the whole Bible, completed Bible. What is it, 1,189 chapters, something like that, of God's heart. We have a lot to test it by to test the fruit, to test what he's saying. And it's simple. If it's from God, keep it, hold on to it. If it's not, let it go, reject it. But this is meant uh, to help encourage, to help build out the spirit of God moving through his church, sent uh, his church to encourage each other. Again, why does this matter? Well, it matters because, A, you can't sanctify yourself. It is the work of the Spirit in your life. And then a touch point for our belonging goal is you also aren't sanctified in isolation. You need each other. We need each other. I need you speaking the, God's hope and life over my life to encourage me to grow in him. And you need, a, need that as well. So we uh, do this in community, in belonging. And this is part of how the Spirit sanctifies us. Another one of my uh, favorite passages for this is in Revelation 3.20 where he talks about the churches. Jesus, uh, this is a church of Laodicea, it says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I love this image of Jesus standing at the door and knocking. But most of the time that's been applied to non-believers, right? Accepting Christ, at least that's how I always heard it growing up. But realize, no, this is for the church. The church of Laodicea who was uh, told that they were lukewarm because Jesus is standing there knocking. It's like I just, I think of this, I mean, I'm just a visual person, so I think about this in my own life. Like I have the house of my life, and I have Jesus coming along, the spirit of Jesus coming along, knocking on the door, and I have a little sign out that says, no room in the inn. Why? Because all the rooms in my house are already full. One of them's full of past wounding, Brings up too much hurt, shame, unforgiveness to deal with, so that door's locked. Another room brings up past sin issues or sin that you're struggling with. Have become too much a part of who you are. Be too hard and scary to let the spirit in there, so that room's locked. Then there's another room with wrong beliefs where we've been believing lies our whole life and have built our lives on those lies. So that room's locked. And then, all these other things, we have to build a whole other room for all the coping mechanisms that we have to be able to handle life with all those other rooms with all the other junk. So there's no room in the end. Hey, wait a second, I've got a closet. Well, Spirit, maybe you could have that closet. Isn't that where we're supposed to pray anyway? Pray in the closet? Yeah, that's a good idea. Here, I'll let you in. You can have that closet as long as you stay there. You can do whatever you want in the closet. Rearrange the furniture, hang the clothes different places, but yeah. We're not going to let you in these rooms. That's quenching the spirit. That's what it looks like. Being able to come and don't do that. Just say, Lord, come and clean everything out. Just pointing at the communion table. We're going to get there in a second. God wants to come in and sanctify your life. 
The last, uh, I guess second to last, but point in this outline is to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Obedience to Christ. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commands. This is one of the things that is uh, so different from any other religion is that we cannot earn favor with God by keeping his commands. We cannot uh, sanctify ourselves by doing what is right. We cannot balance the cosmic scales of right and wrong. It doesn't work that way. We need the cross of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross so that whoever believes, whoever comes to him and says, repents of their sins and believes in Jesus, says, forgive me, I want to follow you as Lord of my life. We get the favor of the Son on our life. You can't earn it. It's a gift because of the cross of Jesus. This is what separates Christianity apart from anything else in this world is the death of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins, the reconciliation because, between God and man because of the love of the Father that gave the Son on the cross. As we come to the table, there's one more phrase that I want to mention um, at the end of verse 2, which is sprinkled with his blood. Sprinkled with his blood. I want us to understand the significance of that phrase as we come to the table. And I put this on your outline just so you have it. You can look more and read later. But there's, I found three major themes of what sprinkled with the blood in the Old Testament was for. The first one was for cleansing, sprinkled with the blood for cleansing. They were to take the blood of a bird and sprinkle it. This is Leviticus 14, sprinkled for cleansing. The next one is sprinkled to be set apart for God's service. This is what Moses did for Aaron when he consecrated Aaron for service in Leviticus 8, he sprinkled him with blood. And finally, there's the sprinkling of the blood for obedience. This is Exodus 24. After God gave the law to Moses, he sprinkled the people in blood in the forming of a covenant and saying, we will follow you, we will obey you, we will worship you. At the table of Christ, we see the body of Christ in the bread. We see the blood of Christ in the cup. We are confronted with the death of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins to all who come to him. So as we come to the table, this is a profound occasion for grace that you could have a testimony of God's grace in your life, that God's grace that he wants to pour out for you. Maybe you come to the table for one of those three things. You come for cleansing, like the rooms in the house that I talked about. There's been a room or the whole house. Um, the table is open for anyone who is in Christ and you wanna come for, for cleansing, to, to confess your sin to Christ. If that's you this morning, we invite you to come to the table for cleansing and repentance of your sin. You might wanna come just as a part of being set apart for service. Say, God, thank you for choosing me. I want to follow you in your death. Participate in your suffering, Lord, that I might have everlasting life and experience your glory. The final one is sprinkling for obedience. You might want to come to the table saying, Lord, out of a deep love, I want to follow you. And as we read all these commands in 1 Peter, we don't do it out of obligation. We try to follow Jesus because of our love. I'm going to pray in just a moment. As I finish praying, I'm going to invite you to come to the table. All of the bread is gluten-free. You can get a, a piece of bread. You can get a cup. And then return to your seat and just hold those elements. And as a worship team uh, plays through a song, just spend a moment 
uh, letting the Spirit of God move in your heart and in your life, and then we will take the elements together. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you have chosen us to be part of your family in your church in this day, in this hour, Lord, when people need you here in this region. Lord, I pray that, uh, that your spirit, Lord, would come and sanctify us, your church. Lord, you would um, move through this body, pour out your spirit, Lord. Help us to experience uh, the process of growing into maturity as you clean out our rooms graciously one by one, Lord, as you help us to follow your commands and obedience. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the table. Lord, we thank you um, for offering salvation to us in your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, no, that's later. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your sacrifice on the cross. Lord, for the power of the gospel and the transforming work of your spirit. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the covenant, the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink. Lord, we thank you for a covenant of love because of the blood of Christ on the cross. Jesus, we love you, Lord, and want to follow you with our lives. As we move into our final song, um, I'll invite you to stand, and there will be a couple buckets that are passed. The first one that comes by uh, will be a bucket for your cups so that you can put those in. The second one is for your connection cards, and uh, that'd be the black one. And, or if you brought a gift as an act of worship this morning, you can put that in as well. Let's stand.
dressed in his righteousness alone I fall and stand before the throne did something in your heart as a result of our gathering, you're welcome to come on up and pray with me, or if you just have a burden you want to be prayed for, I'd love to pray with you up here on the side of the stage uh, when we're done. The benediction for you today, you were called to this table, you were fed at this table, you were united at this table, now you are sent from this table into all the world. Go, therefore, into the world with courage. Set a place for all who hunger. Fill the cup of all who thirst. And as you go, may the spirit of power and love attend you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ uphold you. And may the, greatest, the great faithfulness of our God sustain you now and forever. Amen. Lord bless. Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior.